Now that we understand a bit more how plasticity occurs in the short term, let's explore the long term aspect. To do so, we will consider an important area in the brain named the hippocampus that has been instrumental in the discovery and the development of synaptic plasticity. To find the hippocampus, we can take a coronal section at the level of the temporal lobe. The hippocampus will be located in this external portion of the brain on either sides. Now, the hippocampus is a very important region that mediates a lot of functions like memory, and there is a lot of work done there to support this idea, but for our purposes, we will simply use the hippocampus to introduce some anatomical landmarks that will help us discuss plasticity. Concepts that relate to the connections of the hippocampus and how it mediates memory are topics that will be covered in other videos. Now, when it comes to the circuitry of the hippocampus, we must first note that it has three important regions with distinct cells, the CA1 and CA3 regions, which both have pyramidal neurons, and the dentate region, which has granule neurons. The input to the hippocampus comes from what is known as the perforant pathway, which makes connections on granule cells as well as CA1 cells. Granule cells in the dentate region synapse to CA3 cells through the mossy fiber pathway, and the CA3 cells synapse on CA1 neurons through the Schaefer collateral pathway. This completes the basic circuitry of the hippocampus. I want to note that textbooks will often flip this diagram for some reason, and most likely you have seen the hippocampus in this orientation, but since we do not really consider the anatomical implications of the hippocampus, I will use the unflipped orientation since it is more faithful to the coronal section. In this circuit, two general forms of long-term plasticity have been discovered. Long-term potentiation, or LTP, and long-term depression, or LTD. Let's begin our discussion on long-term plasticity by first discussing LTP and what experiments allows us to see it. For that, we will consider the Schaefer collateral synapse of the CA3 neurons onto the CA1 neurons. Just so we set the anatomical basis, the synapse between the CA3 and the CA1 neurons is mediated by glutamate and is thus excitatory. It is important to note as well that this connection is formed on the dendritic spines of the CA1 neurons. Now, the basic setup for plasticity experiments in such scenarios is to electrically stimulate the presynaptic cell and to record the response from the postsynaptic cell. The EPSP measurements measured at the postsynaptic cell are then plotted across time. When electric stimulations are done at a low frequency, let's say once or twice per minute, the amount of depolarization recorded on the postsynaptic cell is constant and passive. You will notice that the EPSP axis is normalized to the baseline, and the baseline corresponds to this first period when the cell is stimulated at low frequencies. Hence, the first responses that we see here are at 100%. Now, when one induces a very high frequency train of electrical stimulation in the presynaptic cell, also known as a tetanus, it causes the postsynaptic cell to fire. After the tetanus period, the size of the postsynaptic response when the neuron is stimulated again is bigger than what it was during the baseline period. As you can see, the increase in response gets stabilized over time, but the postsynaptic response remains bigger than baseline a long time after the tetanus. In such a plot, we can compute the percent amount of plasticity that has been caused by the tetanus by this equation. Now that we understand how to interpret the basic plasticity recording plots, let's see how we can understand the mechanisms that underlie LTP at the Schaefer collateral. It turns out that LTP at the Schaefer collateral is highly dependent on NMDA receptors. If NMDA receptors seem foreign to you, recall that they are ionotropic channels of glutamate that we've covered in our discussion on different neurotransmitters. One important aspect that we have established in this discussion that can help us prove the relevance of NMDA receptors is that the compound AP5 acts as an antagonist to the NMDA receptors. Hence, when we perform tetanization experiments with AP5 blocking the NMDA receptors, there is no increase in postsynaptic response, and thus it tells that NMDA receptors play an important role in mediating LTP. Two key properties of NMDA receptors that make them such a unique receptor and explain how they can mediate plasticity is that first, their opening requires glutamate binding, and also postsynaptic depolarization to remove a magnesium blocker, and second, they are able to conduct calcium inside the cell when they open. As we've seen time and time again in our discussion, calcium is a very important second messenger in neurons. If you recall the GQ pathway, you will remember that some of calcium's downstream effects are the binding to calmodulin, 
and the activation of distinct kinases such as PKC and CAMK2. The activation of these two kinases leads to two important aspects of plasticity. First, some of their downstream phosphorylation targets are important proteins involved in the transport of AMPA receptors in and out of the membrane. Accordingly, the phosphorylation of these proteins causes AMPA receptors to be moved from internal structures where they are stored to the membrane of the postsynaptic terminal. With now more ionotropic AMPA receptors, the postsynaptic response is considerably increased as more inward current can enter the cell. The second important target for plasticity are the receptors themselves that can get phosphorylated. This phosphorylation causes the channels to open more and let more current enter. In this entire mechanism, there is an important distinction to make between the induction and the expression of plasticity. Induction corresponds to the biochemical cascade that is activated by the tetanus, and the expression corresponds to the actual long-term changes, so in this instance, the addition of AMPA receptors. Now, this form of LTP that I have described lasts only a few hours, and it has thus been called early LTP. However, there are some forms of LTP called late LTP that can last even longer, but they require gene expression and protein synthesis to happen. To get protein synthesis started in plasticity experiments, remember from our discussions on kinases that kinases like PKA or MAPK can phosphorylate transcription factors that can then go into the cell nucleus and start the synthesis of proteins. One common example of such a transcription factor that is important in late LTP is CREB, which comes from the phosphorylation of PKA and MAPK. To get this process started, it turns out that the complex that calcium and calmodulin form can go on and activate a specific type of adenylyl cyclase. Then, this adenylyl cyclase causes the conversion of ATP to CAMP, which activates PKA. PKA can then go on and activate MAPK and CREB. With sufficient protein synthesis in late LTP, it can eventually lead to the formation of new synaptic contacts, which again, will increase the strength of the connection but now for larger timescales, so days, months, or years. Now that we have a good idea of how LTP occurs at the Schaefer collateral, I want to establish some properties that LTP at the synapse has because it is relevant in the grand scheme of the field of plasticity and memory. First off, I want to mention that when we measured the baseline responses before the tetanus was applied, these responses were sub-threshold EPSPs and they were not sufficiently strong to generate a change in synaptic strength. To get LTP to occur, it is required that the presynaptic and postsynaptic partners both get very depolarized within a short amount of time. In an experimental setting, we can achieve this by stimulating the CA3 and CA1 neurons together. When we consider a control pathway that is not stimulated along with the stimulated pathway, we can notice that LTP only occurs at the site where both of the presynaptic and postsynaptic sites were stimulated. This property is known as input specificity. To explain input specificity, we can think back to the NMDA receptor mechanism. Indeed, since the NMDA receptor requires both the binding of glutamate and a postsynaptic depolarization, only the pathway where both of these requirements are met will cause LTP to occur. Now, in more physiological settings, the postsynaptic partner obviously does not get stimulated by an external electrode. Hence, to achieve that postsynaptic depolarization that the NMDA receptors need, many pathways need to cooperate together to reach that threshold. This property of distinct pathways to help each other out is referred to as cooperation. Tied to this idea of cooperation, there was a very influential postulate written by Donald Hebb that said, when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite a cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one of both cells such that A's efficiency, as one of the cells firing B, is increased. Basically, what he is saying in this quote is that when a group of presynaptic cells that on their own cannot make the postsynaptic cell fire manage to make it fire, then these connections should be strengthened. Accordingly, this postulate is often coined as cells that fire together, wire together. From this postulate, you will notice that the temporal ordering from pre to post is very important, otherwise the connection will not be strengthened. This leads to the idea of a coincidence between the pre and the postsynaptic cell, which, as we've seen, is mediated by the NMDA receptor. Along with cooperativity, another fundamental property of LTP that can occur from the result of multiple pathways interacting with each other 
is the concept of associativity. Associativity occurs in a similar fashion as cooperativity, but an important distinction in associativity is that one of the pathways can make the postsynaptic partner fire. The terminology to describe this nuance is to refer to the pathway that can make the cell fire on its own as strong and the pathway that cannot make the cell fire on its own as weak. Hence, in associativity, there is a strong and a weak pathway, but in cooperativity, all the pathways are weak. Nonetheless, the logic for associativity in terms of the NMDA receptor will be similar to cooperativity. The activity of the strong pathway allows to generate a sufficient amount of depolarization for the weak pathway to open its NMDA receptor and subsequently generate LTP there as well. Since we are on the topic, I'll briefly mention that these concepts such as cooperativity, associativity, and input specificity are key to understanding some fundamental aspects of memory, which, as I've mentioned, are mediated by the hippocampus. So, one way to think about cooperativity is that this property ensures that only the events that are really important will result in memory formation because there is a certain amount of threshold that they need to attain before the postsynaptic cell can fire. When it comes to associativity, if you're familiar with Pavlovian conditioning, you will recognize that the two concepts are similar to one another. A strong unconditioned stimulus, which is the strong pathway, will be associated with the conditioned stimulus or weak pathway to enhance the connection between the two. Lastly, input specificity ensures that only specific memories are encoded and retrieved. A final and important definition that I want to establish is the concept of homosynaptic plasticity and heterosynaptic plasticity. If we consider two different pathways interacting on a postsynaptic cell, when one says that LTP is homosynaptic, it means that it occurs at the synapse where the induction happened. On the other hand, heterosynaptic means that the change in response occurs at the synapse where induction did not happen. So, for example, in the associativity scenario, if we imagine that we only stimulate the strong pathway, from its perspective, there is going to be an X amount of homosynaptic plasticity. From the perspective of the weak pathway, there will be no heterosynaptic plasticity. All right, with these definitions now taken care of, I want to address the aspect that LTP can occur through different mechanisms. To do so, let's consider the mossy fiber pathway between the granule neurons and CA3 neurons. Starting with the electrophysiological recordings, it turns out that applying a tetanus to the synapse will also induce LTP. However, if we perform the recording with AP5, you will notice that the LTP still occurs. It turns out that LTP in the mossy fiber pathway is entirely presynaptic, and for that reason, it does not require the activation of NMDA receptors. In this mechanism, sustained depolarizations by the tetanus cause large amounts of calcium to enter the presynaptic terminal. This calcium entry binds to calmodulin and activates a calcium calmodulin dependent adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase converts ATPs to cyclic AMPs which then go on to activate PKA. PKA then goes on to phosphorylate other proteins involved in the vesicle cycle, and that ends up increasing the transmitter release and the postsynaptic response. Now, if we do the electrophysiological experiments with a PKA inhibitor, you will see that the LTP now does not occur. Furthermore, due to the fact that the postsynaptic cell is not engaged, this form of LTP is said to be not associative. All right, now that we have seen LTP in great detail, Let's cover how long-term depression occurs. To see LTD, we can consider again the synapse between the CA3 neurons and the CA1 neurons. In comparison to LTP that was induced by a very high frequency stimulation, LTD arises from very low frequency stimulation of about 1 Hz for 10 to 15 minutes. And as you can see here, the responses after induction now become lower relative to the baseline. The mechanism to induce LTP is actually very similar to that of LTP, because both are mediated by calcium entry from NMDA receptors. However, in LTD, because the frequency of stimulation is so low, small and slow rises of calcium lead the calcium to activate phosphatases instead of CAMK2. Remember that phosphatases are essentially the opposite of kinases, and their activity mediates the removal of phosphate groups. Two important phosphatases that I have been pointed out as being activated in such contexts are PP1 and calcineurin. The activity of these two phosphatases eventually leads to the removal of AMPA receptors that get internalized back into the endosome. Just like in late LTP, there is also a late LTD that is mediated by protein synthesis.
Now, to finish our discussion on plasticity, although the previous experiments that I have introduced in the hippocampus give us very good insights as to how plasticity is mediated, it turns out that the induction protocols are not very accurate as to what happens physiologically. Indeed, trains of spikes in the hundreds of hertz do not occur in the body, but yet plasticity does happen. A more physiological way to induce plasticity is spike timing dependent plasticity or STDP. In this paradigm, the induction is performed by pairing a presynaptic stimulus with the firing of an action potential in the postsynaptic cell at a low frequency. Instead of the frequency of firing, the main variable that we will focus on in STDP is the interval of time between the two stimuli. Generally speaking, when the presynaptic stimuli precedes the postsynaptic stimuli, it causes the connection to undergo LTP. On the other hand, if the presynaptic stimuli occurs after the postsynaptic stimuli, it leads to LTD. To illustrate this relation, we can consider a plot of the time interval between the two signals and the generated response. From this graph, you will notice that for LTP and LTD to occur, it is highly dependent on the time interval. Moreover, the time interval is very small, which means that plasticity can only get induced within a few tens of milliseconds. When it comes to the mechanisms that underlie STDP, they are again believed to be linked to the NMDA receptors in a mechanism that is similar to what we have covered previously. One thing that I will note right now that will be important for us to understand these mechanisms is that when an action potential is triggered in a neuron, it turns out that it can actually backpropagate throughout the neuron back to the dendrites. So, if we consider the LTP scenario first, the presynaptic activity will cause the release of glutamate, and the backpropagating action potential will cause the required depolarization to kick out the magnesium and open the NMDA receptors. Hence, when the activity is pre before post, the NMDA receptors can fully open, let calcium enter the cell, and eventually lead to LTP. In the LTD scenario, because the glutamate arrives after the backpropagating depolarization, only a bit of calcium can enter the cell, which leads to a long term depression by the same mechanisms we have discussed. Based on what we covered previously, you will notice that STDP follows the general principle of Hebb's postulate. If the presynaptic cell contributes to the firing of the postsynaptic cell, then the connection will be strengthened by LTP. However, the other side of this metal cannot be explained by Hebb's postulate. The formal extension to Hebb's postulate came from Gunther's tent, which basically said that the synaptic efficacy between the presynaptic and postsynaptic cell will be decreased by LTD if the presynaptic cell fails to contribute to the firing of the postsynaptic cell. In the context of neuronal development, we can interpret STDP as a simple mechanism that reinforces connections that make the postsynaptic cell fire and removes the connections that are irrelevant to its firing activity. Finally, you will notice that there is an asymmetry in the intervals of time that cause LTP and LTD responses in hippocampal cells. The interval for LTD is much longer than the interval for LTP, and this is most likely explained by the fact that since there is a lot of noise, the interval of LTD must be bigger to refine the connections and make sure that any unnecessary connections are removed. Alright, with the basics of plasticity now covered, we have essentially completed every point that I wanted to cover when it comes to the fundamentals of neurons. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in our next discussion.